There's all kinds of new enhancements to the rendering engine, including some new hybrid global illumination models that are going to allow you to render things faster and cleaner. Those are the sorts of things I would show to the design market. I'd probably show them advanced snapping, where we've basically completely rewritten a system, added incredible advanced technology wrapped up in beautiful moto-like workflows. Taking what was normally a chore and making it a joy. That's what I would do if I was demoing to just designers. I'd probably show them enhancements to the new OpenGL viewports, item-based dimensions, the ability to show scale between items, new HUD displays for things like speedometers and level bars that you can connect to any input value, and of course annotations directly in the 3D viewport. That's the kind of thing I'd show if I was demoing just to designers. I would show the new preset browser that allows you to do star ratings, user tags, comments, and smart searches and filters across multiple directories. That's what I'd show if I was just demonstrating to design artists. I'd show them things like channel handles that allow them to set up a scene that's incredibly simple to navigate. Those are the kinds of things I'd show if I was just demonstrating to design artists, but I'm not. I also have to talk to games artists. So what would I do for the games community? Well, clearly I'd show them motion capture retargeting. That'd be a good thing to show the games artist. Absolutely, I'd show them some sculpting enhancements, like the ability to lock your sculpting stroke to 3D or 2D curves. I'd show them new angle-based flattening algorithm for UV mapping. I'd show them the performance enhancements to UVs. I'd show them symmetry in the UV viewport. I'd show them new tools for modeling, like the extended, uh, edge extend tool with normal or local handles. I'd show them, of course, the baking enhancements, like cross-product normals, cage baking, and vertex normal adjustment with the transform tool. That's the kind of thing I'd show the gamers. I'd probably also show them the snapping. Everybody loves snapping. Now, what if I was just doing demos to VFX? My life would be a lot easier if I only had to demo to one market. This is where I have to slow down, because Shane told me I got all Steve Balmery and started freaking out. <laughs> developers, developers, developers. If I was just demonstrating, to the VFX community, of course I would show them the new referencing system, the pipeline-friendly referencing system that allows you to choose what you want to import from the reference file, that allows you to go in and set rules for what things you want to allow for overrides. I'd show them the new curve rendering options that allow you to animate the curve, render, start, and begin, so you can do parametric curve rendering. I'd, of course, being that we're with the Foundry, Show them the awesome new enhancements we've made for interoperability with Nuke. For example, a ton of new render outputs that enhance the compositing workflow. Enhancements to EXR, so when you bring your la layered EXR into Nuke, it just has everything wired up for you. Of course, I would show you Open Color I.O. integration into Moto 801 that makes workflows with Nuke much, much smoother, of course, and, if, and for other products as well, I might add. Of course, I would show you tiled EXR enhancements and the ability to tile those to disk. All the things that are critical to pipeline work. That's what I'd show to the VFX artists. Of course, I would show Maya inter or Mari interoperability, and probably Maya interoperability too. <laughs> I'd show UDIMs, native UDIM support that comes into Moto as a single texture layer. I'd show the incredible work we've done on animation workflows. If you're a traditional animator and you see that spacing chart, finally someone who speaks my language, that's Moto. Of course, I would show the new graph editor controls like the ability to cycle motion. I would show, of course, wrap deformers and lattice deformers, finally. Of course, I would show the curve probe for rigging. Of course, I would show Bezier deformers. I would show the Bezier falloff. I would show the ability to interactively transform items inside the preview, manipulate your geometry inside global illumination rendering space. Crazy talk. What, what? <laughs> of course, I would show the enhancements to the time tool for navigating keyframes, all the enhancements we've done to the schematic view for riggers, and of course, if I was just demonstrating to VF VFX artists, I would show dynamic curves. I would show deforming rigid body dynamics. I would show impulses that you can add. Thanks, John Knoll, for that feature request. I would show compound rigid bodies with variable glue strength. So you can have things stick together or not based on their own values. Dynamic replicators rock. 
Get it? <laughs> uh, and dynamic replicators can also be static replicators. And of course, I would show audio P mods, the audio particle modifier with signal frequency filtering. These are all the things I would show if I was just demonstrating to VFX artists. Now do you see why I was a little bit terrified to come up here tonight? There's a lot to show. There are a lot of markets, a lot of people to make happy. And I think this product is going to do just that. By the way, I just showed you f over 50 features. I didn't call them all out. But what you just saw represents over 50 features. And that's not even the beginning of it. And this was done in a year, people. A year. That's a testament to our development team. The same core team that started Nexus in 2002 is still together today. And that Nexus architecture continues to yield benefits for us. So I looked at all these different things and I said, what on earth can I demo? And if we're honest, I just demoed a lot. But I do want to show you something live here. And I have to do it rather quickly. But I looked at it and I said, people know us for modeling, people know us for rendering, and the reason they know us for those two things is because of workflow. We have fantastic tools all wrapped up in beautiful workflows. So I thought, why don't I show them a little bit about how we've brought the Moto Touch to the animation workflows. So that's what I'm going to show you tonight briefly. So let's take a look at our first live demo of Moto 801. I'm putting on my glasses. That means I'm serious. Can you not see that I'm serious? OK. Now, quick hats off to two people here. Uh, one is uh, Lucas Pazera. Lucas creates a system for Moto called the Auto Character Setup Toolkit. Uh, it's a kit <coughs> that you can add on to Moto. And then the other person I want to give a shout out to is Brian Vowles. I reached out to Brian, and I said, hey, I want to do a little, little demo of some of the new animation workflows. Could you just bust out a quick character animation for me? Literally, the next day, he sent me the scene file, which I think is pretty cool. It's a little character, a little ace character we have in Moto. Are we getting this on the stream? Double checking. Because I don't see it up there. So anyway, the character's doing this. <laughs> and then he does this. <laughs> so we have these animation workflows inside of Moto, and I showed you a little bit about the spacing chart. And the cool thing is Mark Brown, who heads up our animation uh, tools group, group uh, <clears throat> looked at all the existing sort of ideas for traditional 2D animation, and looked a lot at things like the animator's toolkit, and, you know, it turns out that not too many 3D programs really speak the language of a traditional animator. And so that's what we wanted to bring to the system. So the spacing chart allows you to have literally a spacing chart. If you're not familiar with spacing charts, go Google it. You'll see it's basically it shows you your keyframes, then you have your extremes, and then you do your in-betweens. And the great thing about this workflow, and lately someone was talking on the, I think it was Marinello from the forum, was talking about how I think he said animation was friggin' hard. And it's true. I have to admit, I'm a modeler. My, I like to model, I like to render, but I've never really liked to animate. And part of it was I always felt like I was sort of not in control of my animation. And finally, with these enhancements, I actually feel like I have control of my animation. Because what you do is you can forget about all the curve blending, all the craziness that often comes with traditional keyframe animation, and you focus on First, your key frames, right? How does your motion begin? What tells the story? And you can tell the story, you think about it like storyboards. You can tell the story very quickly in just a few images. And so that's what we do in Moto 801. We start by telling the story with key frames. Then you refine that by adding your extremes. Then you refine that by adding your in-betweens. Looks good, guys. High five to the, to the technical crew. All right. So that's my guy. I did a pretty good uh, impersonation of that, I thought. Thank you. Uh, 
So, you know, earlier I was talking about architecture, and one of the things that's been in Moto from the very beginning of Moto 101 is a system we call actions. And actions are a way to store channel information. So in this case, you see I have a couple of actions here, and you can switch between them uh, on the fly. This is the blocking action that Brian did. Uh, and you can see the keyframes, his workflow was just to lay them out like every five frames. Uh, here's your final animation. You can see he's really refined the timing. I'm going to go ahead and start a new action. Bada bing. We call this BP bad anim. You can, that's foreshadowing. Uh, and then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to show you how you would get started with an animation, okay? So what you would do is we'd come over here and we would bring up our spacing chart. Okay, there it is. So again, if you're a traditional animator, already you're saying, okay, I get it. Oh, that was exciting. <laughs> now, you start by saying, I need to add a key pose. Now, you can use any tools inside of Moto to set your key pose. I'm just going to be lazy and choose the pose, a pose that already exists, and I'm going to set that in there, okay? So Brian happily created some poses for me. So there's one. Now I go ahead of frame. Now, don't think of frame as time. Right? Just think of this in the traditional animation sense. This is another frame. And this one is going to be a key pose. And that key pose is going to be the character kind of flying through the air. So it's going to be up in here. Up in here, as we might say. OK, so now I've got two key poses. Right? I'm starting to tell the story. I can see he's, he's here, then he's taken off. Then I go forward one. I say, you know what? I need another key pose. And this one is going to be him with a massive landing. Set the pose. Where'd he go? He's down here. OK? So there he is. And now I've got these three poses. Boom, boom, boom. Right? It's starting to tell a story. I can see what's happening. If I was doing storyboards, that's probably what I would do. Then you need to go in and add your extremes. Now, the extremes are sort of what happens to contact points. So I can add an extreme here. It automatically shifts those over and sets a nice frame marker. Frame markers are very cool. And we're going to say, let's go ahead and go with, uh, actually, I want heel contact. There we go. Now, you notice he was kind of floating in the air there. Moto will try and create the tween for you. So there you go. That's a nice extreme. Now I need another extreme here. I'm going to add that insert extreme. And this is going to be take off. The passing would be an in-between, which we can also do. So there you can go boom, 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 boom. Now if you wanted to do your passing, your in-between, what you can do is you can go in here and say, in between these two, just draw a line. And that creates a breakdown. Okay? And then I can drag the slider back and forth to bias the position of that breakdown. So again, I'm not worried about time or timing. I'm worried about poses and key elements. And then once I have those in, of course, if you want to do the timing in advance, you can. But you don't have to, because you can come in here and say, select that and start to add some keyframes in, or rather some, uh, insert some time, insert some time here. And now you can see, now I'm starting to get some animation. Right? You just keep refining that, keep refining that. Now, Eventually, you get to something good like this. And if you really want to be, you know, see what's kind of going on, you can come down here to your actor. You can enable onion skinning. And now you get this really nice view here. The onion skinning has all types of controls. You can either set it to frames. You can set it to keys. You can set it uh, to only show the hierarchy instead of the onion skinning. So that's super cool. Now, what if I want to create some action? You may notice this scary boulder over here. So we're going to go over to our setup. Let's just do some dynamics. That would be crazy. That's not the sort of thing you'd want to demo live, because dynamics take forever to generate. So we're just going to go over here to our items. I'm going to go down to my boulder, which I've uh, pre-shattered using the shatter command. It takes about five seconds to shatter, but it's boring to watch when you're listening to a demonstration. So what I want to do here is I want to make that dynamic. So to do that, I go to the dynamics, and I'm going to create a compound rigid body. And you can see. Let's just zoom in a little bit there. There we go. You can see that we have the compound rigid body set up. I'm going to tell it to sleep. Because if I start the simulation right now, it's just going to drop. And that's not very interesting. I want the rock to awake at frame 55. Because you can see, that's about when he's ready to get hit. So we say 55. So chill out until 55. Now, at 55, we need an impulse. And I happen to know we need about minus 18 newtons on n, on z. What? You guys didn't know that? A little trial and error there. Uh, and then you just hit play. Now, it's just it's real time playing. I didn't cache anything, so it's playing. Here he goes. He lands. Then the rock fires, and boom. When it hits him, it shatters apart. Okay? 
That's pretty cool. And by the way, uh, like I said, Brian put together this animation uh, overnight. Uh, I did some lighting and shading. I am not a professional lighter. I have never worked at a visual effects uh, facility. I know you're surprised. Uh, what, what? So if we can go back to the slides, uh, I can show the results. Uh, the thing that I thought was fascinating about this is not only were we able to put this together in a day. Uh, now, Brian's a professional animator, so granted. But I am not a professional. I'm a professional talker. Um, the fact that I was able to then do the simulation, do the lighting setup, and do the rendering, and the foley. <laughs> so let's just take a look at this uh, very quick shot that I rendered at 30 seconds a frame in full HD. Pretty cool. That was pity. That was pity clapping. Uh, but to me, that's, you know, I did that on my laptop. Uh, Brian sent me the file. I was able to block it out. I think that's pretty cool. And, and seeing those workflow, uh, workflows to animation inside of Moto is really super exciting. OK. Um, 